Cool. So welcome. How where where are you at, Brian? Are you on the are you on the beach in Long Island? No, I I managed to stay in my apartment, so <laughs> hopefully the connection will be clear. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our uh, milestone talk. This is our 20th talk so far, which is pretty cool. We are churning them out at this point. Um, and we got a awesome guest this week with Brian Ringley. He is a American architect. Uh, you've kind of done a bit of everything, Brian. You've you've been a an architect, a computation designer at Woods Bagot. You've you went through the the WeWork saga as a construction automation researcher, and you're now at Boston Dynamics uh, as a construction technology manager. And you've also done a fair bit of teaching as well at Pratt, the AA, and CUNY. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining us. I'm super excited to kind of uh, have a little chat today. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. Add to that, or or anything I missed out, but um, yeah, thank you so much. No, that for was that was a uh, that was a pretty accurate summary. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. No. So everyone in the crowd, again, uh, we are on a roll here. We are recording this session, and we will. Well, I say we'll, we're attempting to record it as we did last week, which was uh, which was pretty successful. Um, and so we will be trying to post it later on. But um, yeah, as usual, we got Guillaume and Faisal. I think um, I think Guillaume is tuning in, and Faisal is on a bit of a VPN uh, question mark. So I don't know if you can you can chime in at the moment, Faisal. But um, yeah, let's let's jump into it. So um, before we jump into the world of robotics and spot the dog, Brian, I think what's kind of really interesting about you is, like I said, you've kind of had this unique experience uh, where you've gone from, let's say, uh, an architecture practice, you then went through, I mean, you've done a lot of teaching in between as well, you then went through the startup world in in WeWork, and you now work for this kind of, you know, very famous robotics company. Um, And maybe it'd be interesting to kind of explain a little bit about that journey, because um, I mean, one thing I'm, I'm talking a lot about as someone who's still in the uh, traditional architecture game, I guess you could say, is like, you know, how much technology is playing a role and how it's kind of affecting what we do as architects and also the future of architecture practice. And, um, you know, you see these tech giants coming into our space, the, the, the WeWorks, the Googles and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you've kind of gone through that and now you're at that this kind of new level of, of like, uh, this, this amazing robotics company, but yeah. How, how was your journey from like, you know, when you left Woods Bagot, you kind of ventured into that startup world. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying my hardest to get out of architecture and then you just pull me back into these, into these architecture. Yeah. yeah. Um. (laughs) Yeah, Brian is also a, a clubhouse zombie. We've brought him back from the dead. He deleted the app and we've brought him back. So (laughs) I feel yeah, like if you're wondering why I only have like five followers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <it's... laughs> yeah, make sure to give Brian a little follow and uh, uh, entice no. him back That's in with, with your because uh, there's a few people in the crowd that have their own little rooms and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a good little audience here. Yeah, I was like, just what I need in my life, another <laughs> social media platform. I feel like I feel like Clubhouse was kind of at the very end of uh well at least my quarantine i know that that's ongoing for for many people and now that i'm not in quarantine i don't necessarily want to be on my phone but again yeah i'm excited to be here and yeah. talk about this i mean yeah the, um, the clubhouse thing has definitely gone through uh hype and then slowed down and then hype again and yeah it's been a bit of a a little roller coaster but i mean we we've stuck with it so far I do. I do like how weird it is. There are some really bizarre rooms yeah. on this app, um, which is kind of cool. But yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of my career, you know, I often get the question from from young people, um, especially if they're studying architecture, who are interested in the technology and robotics space, and they ask me advice. You know, how did you get to a robotics company from an architecture degree? And I, it wasn't on purpose. So 
uh, it's hard, it's hard to give uh, advice. There's not a recipe to get here, but the way it kind of worked out for me was I really just wanted to be a, a traditional architect, a designer. I had done internships in grad school for Francois Roche and uh, Derek Delacamp and really liked the idea of a small design studio. And I had always had a love for technology, but that wasn't really central to what I was doing. And then the recession hit 2008 and 2009 when I was graduating uh, from grad school in the US and I just couldn't get a job. So I had done a graduate fellowship in the fabrication lab at my university which had primarily catered to industrial designers and transportation designers. And I had to kind of make up a job for myself, which is, can I stay here, but serve as a liaison for the architecture and interior design community and actually ended up extending it into fashion and graphic design as well, which was really cool. So that kind of committed me to the technology side. You know, I really focused very intensely uh, those several years, um, it was the Rapid Prototyping Center at the University of Cincinnati College of DAP, where I learned to do CNC programming, uh, power mill pre Autodesk by many years, and and operate all of those machines. And that's also where my love for uh, driving a machine with a design model really started to kick in. And I started teaching too because, uh, you know. You, you're not always making enough money, so you start to do a little teaching on the side, and that's when Grasshopper first started. Uh, I think it had gone from explicit history in 2008 to being called Grasshopper in 2009. So I was doing a lot of digital fabrication. I was teaching a lot of design computation. We didn't call it design computation at the time. Um, and then I feel like an old man going back through this, but you know that really that really ended up giving me a really solid base in in technology. But I still yeah. really wanted to practice, and I really wanted to practice in New York City specifically. So there was a national science. Uh, the Obama administration did all sorts of really great things for small colleges and community colleges uh, with respect to changing curriculum and understanding how technology was impacting jobs. So there was a National Science Foundation grant won by the City University of New York um, in the New York City College of Technology, which is known as City Tech. And that's where I that's where I got to go in and build my own fabrication lab from scratch and also design curriculum in three key, key areas around BIM um, computational fabrication, which is we we decided that was different from digital fabrication because there were new opportunities with tools like Grasshopper and scripting. Yeah, I, and, I didn't know you did. Yeah. You went through that. Was that that was before Woods Bagot? Or... Yeah, this was all before Woods yeah. Bagot. But this is also where I met. This is where I met Shane Berger because mm. we. It was a really it was a really nice experience because one, it was an unaccredited program in the U.S., which means that we could make up our own rules. Um, you know, a lot of architecture schools that are, are architecture schools that are accredited in the U.S. are they have to teach certain things about architecture. And we may not all always agree that those certain things are relevant or that they allow for uh, a kind of diversity of careers after the degree. So what was nice was we could really take control of that. We could see the shifting tides and what was going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years and start teaching toward that. And that's where, you know, that's also where I learned BIM and, um, you know, various types of energy analysis like Diva and Vasari and uh, Ladybug, I think was in its early days. And that's also where we had a, an advisory committee that was made up of a bunch of, you know, it's lovely to be in New York City and have access to those professionals. So that was made up of a bunch of architects and um, analysts and specialists and, you know, people from fabrication shops and people who do energy analysis and people who do structural glass. It was a really cool mix of professionals. And the idea was that they would come in and they would advise us on what to teach again to broaden the opportunities for these students and not have such a narrow idea of what architectural practice is. And that's where I met Shane. He was, he was an advisor and I really admired uh, what he had done um, at Grimshaw and with smart geometry earlier in his career. And then he had pretty recently transitioned to be the head of design technology at Woods Bagot. 
and then there was a job opening and this was this was pretty shortly also after the completion of samri which is a you know kind of a seminal parametric design project in adelaide australia by woods baggett so it all kind of coalesced into this job opening and i just immediately you know wrote him and said i'd really love to get back into practice and come work for you um and that's how i got out of the initial I would say like six years postgraduate school of, of just teaching and research and, and academic yeah. work into professional practice. Yeah. And you had a good little crew at, at uh, Woods Baggett. There was, um, there was a good little cohort of you guys. And then most of you got, got hoovered up by WeWork, right? That's when uh, uh, that was, you did, uh, <laughs> did Andrew, Andrew Human went to WeWork, right? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So Andrew, you know, Andrew's the best. Um, and I, I think ever since I made a Twitter account, he was one of the first people I saw doing amazing things with, with Grasshopper. And he was at NBBJ. Um, fun fact, I interviewed for that job um, that he had at NBBJ uh, and did not get it because Andrew is more talented than me, but that's okay. It worked out. Um, that was when I was also interviewing at CUNY. Uh, so I went to New York instead of Seattle, and Andrew went to Seattle, but then uh, met him in person, I think, for the first time at Autodesk University one year, probably like 2013 or 2014, and, you know, got to know him in person, and eventually uh, Shane and I were able to coax him over to our side yeah. and and poached him for our team, which was amazing because, you know, sitting by someone that talented, you really get to absorb a lot, so he taught me everything I know about uh, .NET and and c sharp um yeah. you know for better or worse <laughs> but yeah we we um, actually will have to have then, him on to talk yeah. about what he's doing with hyper and stuff because um it's kind of it's some interesting oh, yeah. stuff yeah absolutely um yeah and he's you know and he's also such a disciplined user of grasshopper and now i have really you know crazy opinions about how you should use that software but he was also very open minded about how it could be applied toward really any kind of problem and also the legitimacy of you know no code platforms like grasshopper visual programming um versus purely text based um you know compiled programming so and the importance of ui you know all these really powerful ideas and i think he's really you know getting to concentrate that getting to concentrate on that pretty deeply at high power, which yeah. is really great to see. Yeah. We, I was just um, listening to a talk. He's on uh, computational next right now. Oh, I think he just finished. Um, yeah. I think he's uh, talking at the same time. Yeah. I, was, yeah, I have that on my other screen just, <laughs> just before this, but <laughs> what's your view on the whole startup world? Cause I, I, I actually, I, I, Guillaume and I gave a presentation in the office about just computation in general. And, and we were also like, Hey, uh, you know, keep your eye out because there's all these, um, there's all these tech companies coming into our, into our AEC space, you know, and, and at the time there was, you know, Google was, was sort of dipping their toes in with, um, I was sidewalk labs and, and the whole Toronto waterfront. Yeah. Then there was Katera that was, you know, however many billion dollars of funding, you know, we work, were kind of flirting with, or well, they were just hiring a lot of AEC people. Um, and, yeah. you know, Amazon was saying they're kind of interested in, in prefabrication. And I was like, hey, you know, watch out. And then since then, of course, you, Katera went bust like a, a month ago. Uh, WeWorks had its has it up, ups and downs. And, uh, you know, the sidewalk yeah. slab thing kind of fell through. But, I mean, I, I not that I think that, you know, I think there is this startup culture in the AEC space. Like, you know, our industry is rife for innovation and disruption. And I, I can see, you know, maybe there's a little hurdle to come over, but I can see a lot more people going to work for startups more than practices in the future. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Is that something you can see? I yeah. mean, you've obviously kind of had a bit of experience actually going over there. Um, in, in Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought I thought a lot about this even in back of what's bag it, and I mean, <laughs> there there were a couple of things to think about. One was just pay and quality of life. Right. Um, I mean, I had it I had it really good with with Woods Baggett, but you know, the starting salary of architects today hasn't really budged from yeah. where it was. It's pre pre recession, which is so long ago. Yeah, now. it's almost as though I, I mean, we we're planning another talk actually to to rethink the business model of architecture. It's it's almost like I don't know if the business model works 
anymore. I, I don't know. It's it's a tricky one, isn't it? It's it's the same story, yeah. but different countries and different firms. And yeah, well, my decision to join the startup world and leave architecture was was actually somewhat impacted by by big. Um, oh, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> Well, okay. So there were, there were a lot of different things going on. I mean, one is that, you know, I mentioned Shane Berger being in charge of the design technology team at Woods Bagot. He was actually one of the first clients of a, of a BIM consultancy started by uh, Dave Fano, Steve Sanderson and Fed Negro called Case. And yeah, they had started early on kind of after they left shop architects, they were advising architecture firms, hey, you need to start splitting out IT differently from design technology. These yeah. are two different disciplines within the office. So they, you know, they basically, you know, headhunted Shane and, and convinced Woods Beckett to take that route, uh, you know, which obviously impacted my future. They also had kind of a longstanding relationship with Woods Beckett, And I did my Revit, my official Revit training. Um at case. Mm. And I remember being in their offices and seeing them work on these like weird super families um, that almost seemed like these modular kitchen areas and office areas and leisure areas. And I was like, what, you know, what is that? And it's like, oh, we have this, we have this really small client called WeWork that does <laughs> office space. Um, and then WeWork became a very large yeah. client, large enough. <laughs> Little did they know. Case. <laughs> yeah. So we work, we work swallowed case and right. acquired them. Um, and that's when they started, you know, hooverizing a lot of the design technology talent, um, especially in, in North America. And while they were doing that, you know, I was in touch with a lot of them and was friends with a lot of them in the, in the New York area. And we started doing, I think we just had, I think we started doing some kind of like dynamo thing, um, like where we'd have occasional workshops and get together and just talk about the latest and greatest. Um, it wasn't quite like a user group. I think it was a little bit more informal than that. But we all got together and we were hosted it. And I was talking with, I think it was Jason Anderson, um, who was working there at the time. And I ended up actually taking his job when he got promoted to something else. But he was talking about this idea of using robots to do layout for walls. And I was like, all right, you had me. You had me there. Like, you don't have to say anything else. Sign, sign um, me up. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, uh, so that was really, that was really exciting to me. Um, so that kind of got me excited about the opportunity, but that wasn't what kind of made it. That was, it, then it was in combination. I was working on, are you familiar with the 76 11th Avenue, the 11th project? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You guys did the yeah. whole facade kind of uh, elements and like you went, yeah. you went pretty nuts on the BIM model there, right? <laughs> yeah, we went really <laughs> We went really crazy. This was the era of flux and I was kind of all in with, which I thought was a great product, you know, regardless of how the business case worked out. But so, uh, and that's also when we did the Andrew, uh, helped me to do the Metagraph, which was the, uh, using visual programming to track all of your interrelated, uh, all of your interrelated GHA and Dynamo files, um, really kind of dealing with global variable variables the things that, you know, um, you can probably do with other apps now by default, but, uh, so we, so we like did a lot of really interesting things on that project because there was a lot of complex geometry and, you know, we were designing, we were getting design intent as Rhino models from big. And then we were kind of translating that into, into logic and putting that into grasshopper and then migrating that over to Revit as, as actual construction design components and blah, blah, blah. Using, uh, um, and human. Yeah. The human plugin. I mean, or we were using a little the bit old of, elephant style. <laughs> no, Andrew wouldn't, Andrew wouldn't let me <laughs> use elephant for a while. Was, but yeah, a lot of, you know, duplicate, yeah. duplicate functionality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We actually didn't, we probably didn't need that much of that stuff. Oh, really? Um, yeah, because I mean, it was just pure, it was just pure geometry manipulation. I mean, Wombat, we ended up making Wombat with some lessons learned from doing a lot of facade work over the years. Um, so there was probably a little bit of that. But, you know, it was really about, um, it was just a wireframe model, right? Like a skeleton model. And because all of the uh, architectural elements, which were being documented at CD level and sheet sets, would be articulated by the families that we would automatically instantiate yeah. in Revit. So and of course you'd have... 
Yeah. Yeah, and of course, uh, this this whole story, we're actually missing a character. We should have uh, my boss Jan in in the room because yes. you know his story is very ingrained in that. I think it was like Case that that recommended him to Big, and then he became the BIM manager at Big, <laughs> and he was working with you yeah. guys on that project, and now he's uh, the BIM director here at Big. Um, and yeah, he's That's the guy right. that hired me. Yeah. So. He's, uh, I've been conv- trying to get him onto Clubhouse, but I don't think he's, uh, I invited him. I think he's got a page, but he hasn't, I haven't seen his face yet. I'll have to, we'll have to do a talk of him. But, yeah. Um, well, I remember, yeah. And I remember when Woods Baggett first won their scope of work, um, along with Big and they were about to go to their first meeting with Big. And I was like, do you want me to come? <laughs> And they were like, I don't know, do do we need you there? And I was like, I was like, it's probably a twisty tower. You probably need me there. Um, so <laughs> it was good. And I met Jan. So Jan had, and this is, a, this actually brings up an interesting like challenge in the industry, which is that Jan, you know, was like a dynamo master and had done all of DD completely in dynamo graphs and, I spent like a week looking at those graphs and thinking like, should I try to use these Mm. moving forward? But ultimately the logic was so tied to the DD level of representation in Revit um, that we kind of went back. Also, to be honest, Dynamo is just really hard to use if you're trying to do down and dirty geometry. So um, it was just so much easier to do the skeleton model, you know, get all of your significant edges and points in Grasshopper, and then just use Dynamo to automate the placement of things. You guys were just short of uh, the Rhino Insight era. Uh, A few few years short, I guess, but... Yeah, I think that was like like, three years later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would have been been nice. Uh, But Flux was... I mean, Flux was pretty amazing in what it did. I mean, Flux, yeah. I think, failed just because they couldn't make money off of it. But it was a really nice product. Um, so, so, and you you then went to go to WeWork, and you were were you in any kind of robotics? Because um, I know your your job title was like a, a researcher kind of thing, right? An automation yeah. researcher. Was that anything to do with robotics, or was that kind of that? You know, I know what what Andrew and, and yourselves and the WeWork crew were working on was like, you know, automated layouts and generated uh, floor plans and things like that. Or w- was there any kind of robotics element when you were there, kind of thing, or or not? Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, it was about can we use the intelligence of design automation and these various computational methods, and can we push beyond the traditional scope of the architect? Mm-hmm. So, which what you're saying, which is you can't really innovate on this tired business model of design, bid, right. build. So, so I got, you know... I started sniffing around and had a few interviews and they made me a job offer. And then I was like, can I bring Andrew? <laughs> um, which I think is the, the only time I've uh, made a condition of my hire to also hire my friend. Um, <laughs> That's a good move. And yeah. And they were like, sure. Um, and Andrew was on, he was like on a business trip to like Dubai or something for Woods Baga. So he got back like super late at night and I was like, can you call me? And he called me and I was like, so I kind of got you a job while you're out of the country. Is that cool? Um, <laughs> so then, yeah, that brought us, that brought us over to WeWork. Welcome back. Uh, we're moving to some, <laughs> moving to someone new. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, so that was fun. Um, and then we went on different teams. So he was really focused on the design automation side of things. And then I was interested, yes, in construction robotics and in, um, industrialized construction. So I had also been teaching this whole time. So when I joined Woods Bag, I stopped teaching at CUNY and I started, uh, teaching at Pratt in the graduate architecture and urban design program. And I had set up like a little baby IRB 140 at, uh, at City Tech, which was my first industrial arm. And then at Pratt, um, Mark Parsons and the dean and the directors had started a new robotics lab there um, where they had a few ABB arms as well. So I wrote the first courses for that and kind of helped with getting that lab up and running and getting the students engaged with that. So I had a, you know, I had a background in static industrial arms and the idea of architectural manufacturing offsite 
And I brought, I kind of tried to bring that to bear at WeWork as well. And WeWork was focused on, I was doing several things. One is I was setting up some lab spaces where we could test these ideas around manufacturing our own products. And then uh, I was also setting up a factory uh, with, with a bunch of people on my team where we were going to make our storefront and started actually manufacturing our storefront, our interior glass and aluminum wall systems oh, with always, specialized Yeah, CNC I always wondered if they got to that stage. I was kind of, that's interesting that they were experimenting with that. Yeah, we did. That was, I think, about the time that factory launched was the time when things were, were going pretty far south. So there was pretty scant media right. oh, on see. it. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, you know, that was really the promise of a lot of what we had been working on over the years was to take design automation tools and be able to send them straight to a factory. And what I learned, too, was like it wasn't just as simple as reverse engineering G code and various text files that run these machines. I learned a lot about ERP systems and work orders and, and like lean and supply chain and all these other things that actually matter when you're trying to use a design model to drive manufacturing yeah. at that scale. So that was, that was a really valuable, valuable lesson and a difficult problem. Um, but the other, the other half of what I was working on was field mm. robotics. Uh, so this idea of, you know, so there's one half, which was industrialized construction, the idea of robots and machines in a fixed environment, uh, creating unitized prefabricated pieces to be deployed, you know, around the country to different construction sites. But then there was the idea of mobile robotics moving through cons active construction yeah. sites. Um, and yeah. we, I was really lucky in terms of the timing because I got to like, I got to see the Hilti J-Bot and the Canvas robot and the Dusty Layout robot, like all of those things before they were out of stealth. And in some cases to be able to even use them and, you know, analyze their value on projects. Um, but that was a little bit more in the future, the idea of robots automating construction tasks. What was really important to us was progress monitoring. Um, we had, in New York alone, we had a couple dozen active sites. And as a researcher, it was really hard to know what the status was of one site versus another. So if I was working on a prefab toilet and I wanted to go to a site where there was an open wet wall so that I could see how we were installing a current system, the idea was to go into our software uh, field lens and then be able to see the progress. But the progress wasn't tracked particularly well by people. And we had acquired a few general contractors as well at WeWork, and they hadn't brought in a lot of data about their practices in the field either. So we were really looking for a way to bring in mobile robots to automate job site uh, data. At capture. that point, you're just talking about literally a, a guy with a camera or like, you know, cameras installed in the construction site or like, what is the data? Like, how are they, you know, it, it's just yeah. a guy saying, yeah, this thing's done. <laughs> And like a, a terrible photo yeah. So there were, yeah, exactly. I mean, there were kind of yeah. There were two ways to go about it: either you instrument the space or you move the sensor through the space. So moving the sensor through the space is cheaper because you have less sensors and you don't have to do any kind of permanent installation in what is essentially a temporary environment when the building is under construction. Yeah, I would have. I would have never actually thought that that would be the kind of. Uh... I guess the the low hanging fruit for for the use of robotics, but it it makes total sense when you explain it. Um, and of course, this is what you're kind of I guess this is the connection to Boston Dynamics, and and then you went over and started to work with Spot the Dog, for example, right? Yeah. So I you know I'd always thought of my career as how do I use you know essentially design models or digital models to communicate directly with machines downstream so that a designer can have more control um, and more control later in the design process. And then what I learned was you don't necessarily want that level of control all the way. You know, if you really get down into the subcontracted trades, they actually have a lot of expertise that you want to be able to rely on and decision making that you want to leave open ended for them and not over constrain. So then it struck me, oh, there's zero feedback loop, you know, when you have an active, because at WeWork, we built fast. So when we were in a design model, it was an active construction site. So there was no difference between 
the design phase and the construction administration phase, which I think was really influential on my thinking. So you just, I was just like struck by the fact that nobody ever knows what's going on on a job site. Like you're sitting in an office as a designer and something's being built based on your information and you have no idea how it's manifested. And, you know, I, I'll bet you a dollar that it's not what you think. So yeah, it became clear to me that establish some kind of establishing some kind of positive feedback loop with site data um, was was really the way to start to build some kind of digital foundation, something we now refer to, I think, as the digital twin um, in a kind of oversimplified way. But just the idea that at any given moment you have streaming reality capture data showing you um, how things have actually manifested on site so that you can react to that, catch mistakes early and just know what's going on at any given moment to better manage that. So we were trying to do that with drones and with wheeled and tracked vehicles and you know, I tried a lot of, I tried a few off the shelf kits, you know, you know, build it yourself with, um, with boards and RC car chassis and stuff like that. Um, you know, I tried some drones, I tried some companies that had come out that had put cameras on tracked vehicles and they were all so terrible and specifically for interior commercial construction environments. Drones are still, killer. Do you when still have outside. these? Like this army of little drone bots like drones and cars and stuff i mean they're in a they're in a we yeah. work space somewhere i presume <laughs> damn yeah. that'll be like a wicked little uh little box to find <laughs> i know yeah um yeah somewhere somewhere in the old we work lab i don't even know what the state of that is but um yeah there's a lot of weird little yeah. machines and and it just it, none of it worked like it was all terrible. Um, it, they, nothing could deal with obstacles on the job site, static or dynamic, couldn't deal with stairs, couldn't deal with gaps, couldn't deal with ramps, uh, couldn't deal with closed doors. You know, there were just so many problems. So I think that, you know, I had actually in my initial report in like, I don't know, 2017 at WeWork, I acknowledged different types of locomotion that could be used. And I was like, yeah, there are legged robots, like bipedal robots and quadruped robots and hexapod robots. I was like, but those are too exotic for the problem we're trying to solve. And then later I was like, wait a minute, I think this is the only way to solve this problem. And in, I think early 2018, Boston Dynamics came out with their first video of the black alpha spots being used on a Japanese construction site. And I just like went crazy and put all of my time into trying to contact Boston oh. Dynamics. Okay. Um, so, yeah. And then, uh, you know, two weeks later, I think, you know, uh, Tim Dumitrate and I were up in Boston um, meeting with meeting with their CEO and meeting with my now boss, uh, Michael Perry. So Rob Plater and Michael Perry and talking about the business case for WeWork, and they were looking to get onto North American construction mm-hmm. sites following uh, their early work in Japan. And then that led to me being a spot customer um, starting in the summer of 2000, or wait, in December 2018, I think is when we officially oh, started. okay, so you them. guys were using it with WeWork as a, as a customer then. And then you went, I see, I see. Yes. Interesting. Um, there's a, there's a kind of interesting, I was going to touch on, on Japan because they have a bit of a history with like construction and, and robotics. I think, was it in the eighties or nineties? They, they, they had this like shortage of, of skilled labor and they started up and the economy was booming and they started to experiment with like all these crazy robots that like were bricklaying robots or like plastering robots and all that kind of stuff. And most of what you talked about so far, I mean, I can really see you've got robotics in a factory, like the robot arm printing, you know, 3D printing or, you know, CNCing stuff and all that kind of stuff. That's part of that prefabricated world. And then you've got the kind of what you're talking about, the the spot the dog, the kind of... Um, what was the word you used to kind of more like monitoring and, and kind of um, surveying the site and all that kind of stuff. Is there, do you, do you foresee like uh, we'll, we'll get to the point that the Japanese tried to experiment where robots are actually constructing things like, you know, putting up laying bricks and, you know, whatever it is, or is that kind of a bit of a, a false like fallacy that, that, that that's going to come kind of thing. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think some variation of that will come. I do think it's a really right. hard problem, and that's part of why I was compelled to go to the site monitoring side because I said, well, we need to have this feedback loop. Because once we have this feedback loop, that means we can trust our design models. A huge part of my, I guess, challenge at, at WeWork was we had the world's best BIM teams and you still couldn't do any, you couldn't drive any automation from our models in terms of mobile robots, because as anyone who's worked extensively with BIM, especially in existing building structures knows, is that what actually manifests in the real world, in the built environment, will differ enough from your model. And I don't think we acknowledge this enough, which is that BIM is design intent only. So I get all sorts of questions around using BIM to drive robots, which is a passion of mine. And I want to get there to where that can scale in a practical and value add way. But until your models are actually correct with what's being constructed in the real world, there's really no point in that. So we spent a lot of time with the reality capture team at WeWork developing that. And this is what got me thinking about the feedback loop was we scanned every single building um, and we would bring in those scans and we would design off of them. But what was happening was scanning was really labor intensive and we had a lot of projects and you often wouldn't get that scan data until toward the end of a project because we built so fast. So you could really only use that data as due diligence to make sure you didn't make some huge mistake, like put a desk in the middle of a column, but you couldn't really use that to make sure that you could trust your model right. and to drive robotic motion in the field. That from makes so model. much sense as you're, as you're saying it. Um, yeah. And so, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I mean so then, uh, so you guys were using it with WeWork a little bit and then eventually you kind of went over to, to Boston Dynamics full time, essentially. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I was sitting there thinking about, you know, your question too, which is like, what is the future job yeah. site going to look like? And I said, well, yeah. I was like, you kind of have to think, I'm very, I'm very bullish on industrialized construction. I think a lot of things for, for large complex projects will be built off site and the act of construction will become more centered on logistics about getting those components from Just the factory to the site. Pure assembly. And then you kind of say... Yeah, well, what does that what does that leave to do on site? Yeah, it's 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 assembly, it's it's layout, it's reality capture, it's finishes. Um, so that should really kind of inform where people are putting their their robotic effort. So the bricklaying example is a really is always kind of a funny one in my mind. I have many anti robot brick tweets. Even as not um, not a huge but, robot robot <laughs> nerd, but like the robot bricklaying thing seems like the dumb it's like creating a robot to deliver a letter like right before email is about to be invented or, or something like that like <laughs> why are we spending time like why are we building with these tiny little bricks like in the first place that's that's an excellent analogy yeah and it's also like you know you can argue if you even if there's any reason to have a uh, brick at right. that scale at all in terms of how it's built now. Um, but uh, there's some yeah. beautiful brick buildings, obviously. But like for the most part, you could just use just do a precast panel and make and make it look like fake yeah. brick, like uh, Mulberry Avenue by Shop right, Architects. Right. But um, that's I mean, fast brick robotics. I always point to them because I'm like I kind of I have a lot of problems with. Uh, concrete 3D printing. Um, I'm not, by the way, I don't dismiss any of this stuff as out of hand. There are a lot of really smart people out there working on these problems. So like I'm, I'm open-minded about these things, but I, I think there's, there's some problems with, with like concrete 3D printing. And there are some problems with, with brick laying where it doesn't quite seem to be the best use of the technology and the most sustainable and intelligent use of the technology. But then there's fast brick robotics who have the Hadrian X which is this like vehicle with like a robotic arm that dispenses like giant, you know, robot size, like CMUs and, and deposits them autonomously. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, here's a convergence of this kind of idea of additive with modular brick and additive as, you know, just a concept, you know, 3d printing or robotic concept. And, and to me, that actually seems really intelligent. It's a somewhat limited use case, 
in terms of a lot of maybe single and, and two story buildings, but you know, CMU block yeah, is I'm, a very popular I'm, way of building and I'm it's just solved looking an at it now and for the for the audience if I'm looking at the right one, it's it's almost like a dump truck with a giant arm is, is what you're talking about, right? And it has just packed. Yeah. yeah. It's like a Pez dispenser. It's like it's got this like arm that's like a little Pez dispenser that like spits out these bricks. But these bricks were sized yeah, that, larger because why yeah. would a robot waste his time? Yeah, they're like tiny CMB little human bricks. Blocks. Um, I, I, yeah. I've always been a little bit skeptical of 3D printing because I was just like, you know, it's it's going through that height curve. But I've been kind of pleasantly surprised how far it's come with companies like Icon 3D printing where, you know, they're actually 3D printing homes. Um, and I think, you know, the material will catch up to it, to, you know, the, the technology in terms of like, being a bit more sustainable, not, you know, pure concrete or some kind of bio-based concrete or, or some other material. Um, branch 3D printing is, is super exciting as well. You can kind of, they've done experimental pavilions, but they also can do like um, facade panels and stuff like that. So I'm a, I was a bit more of a skeptical 3D printing guy, but now I'm, now I'm a little bit more solid. I have to admit, it seems like it's moving a bit faster. Um yeah. I don't question its viability. I question its sustainability. It's just, uh, it's the way I felt when I very first started seeing um, people, and I'm guilty of this too in my teaching, which is, you know, we're going to analyze the exact forces on this pavilion. And then we're going to make this pavilion out of some kind of like hmm. monocoque shell or composite material. And what you're doing is you're designing a, a space that is too functional. It only works in one point of time for one particular thing with one particular you know program and set of forces on it. And it's made out of this highly toxic material that you mm. can't break down or change. So you can't reconfigure this, this building or this space to be used for anything else. And that applies to a lot of composites and that applies to, to concrete. So my, my concern there is, there's been not very much effort into figuring out how to break these things down, only how to build them up. And that really concerns me. I mean, it's great that you can build a lot fast. I mean, but that's not actually like what's going to solve the housing problem. I, I also think so. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of bad ideas out there that are kind of combining, which is like, well, it's okay to be unsustainable and 3d print like a million houses because right. there's the housing problem. It's like the housing problem is from the privatization of the housing industry, not the supply. So yeah, there's, there's just a lot of, multi you know, we, we have to think, yeah, we got to think a little bit harder about that one, but I feel like we're not, we're just plowing forward with it as, as we often do with fun and sexy new technologies. So I, I think there's a lot of room for, for criticism and for alternative approaches. And yes, there are a lot of, there are a lot of programs out there. One of the most exciting things I think happening in architecture schools and design computation is experimenting with new types yeah. of materials. And especially if you're doing that in combination with, you know, robotic yeah. 3D printing of, of biomaterials or, or, you know, at least thinking about how to do something in a modular and reconfigurable way, which is not a new idea, but is something that's kind of lost on us when we start to think of everything as one big monotonous yeah, 3D print. That, yeah, that's definitely, um, you're not seeing a lot of modular 3D printing. I guess it doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense at the moment, but uh, I could totally see that. I've been really into mass timber. I think there's, there's a lot that's, um, that, that mass timber brings. That's quite Absolutely. interesting. Um, but so maybe we'll jump on to a little bit of, of what you're doing with Spot. And so you are now the, the robot whisperer to uh, Spot the Dog. And for those of you in the audience who, who are unfamiliar, look up Boston Dynamics and spot the dog. And I'm sure everybody has seen like the, the kind of fun videos you guys make of these robots like dancing or, you know, doing their actual jobs and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and it's super exciting to see. I mean, it, it's crazy to like whenever I show people who haven't seen it, they're like, this is an animation. I'm like, no, it's, this is real. Cause it, it does look, unreal in a way it's it's i love to see it in person like it, i think it'd be even more unreal in person um 
Yeah, the the big difference in person is you can just you can hear all the say, like, servo yeah, like, motors like going and, and the fans and the fans uh, kicking yeah. on as the robots are. Dancing. I guess that makes it a little <laughs> bit more um, scary in a way. You could hear this thing like coming <laughs> coming at you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like it's more. It's actually more machinic, and I, I think part of what freaks people out and part of what makes it seem so surreal to see is that you're these things are moving like animals you know they're they're really really complicated computers running very advanced code that that have legs on them and are able to balance and do interesting and and ideally useful things um but because they move in the way that in some cases humans and animals move you start to think about them differently and perceive them differently. And for some people that that can be frightening. Um, and, and I understand that. Uh, so, you know, we do spend a lot of time making sure that we, we educate people in, you know, how we put out some articles, for example, about how the dancing yeah. stuff works. And it's like, we bring, we bring in a human choreographer and we bring in a Maya animator and, you know, and then we and then we start to run that stuff through our software and our control systems and and upload it to the robot and the robot's not going to do a dance move we didn't tell it to um so uh and i think that i think we can do a better job of that and we will continue to do a better job of that which is just educating the world how these things work because there are a lot of ideas out there that have been you know misinformed by the media and by sci-fi <laughs> movies um and you're like, eh, it's still, yeah. it's still just a computer, you know, or a series of computers. But uh... yeah, I think it's it's interesting. And and if I'm not wrong, so Boston Dynamics, like they they you know develop these robots, not specifically for the construction industry, for like many industries. But you are specifically, and they are interested specifically in the construction industry, right? And is that that came about because it just seemed like a um, an industry that was ripe for disruption and very applicable to the construction space or how did, you know, was it, was that like always on their radar kind of thing or it was, it's just kind of came about. Yeah. I mean, unlike, unlike one of our robots stretch, which was designed specifically for the warehouse industry spot was conceived of as a general mobility platform, something that could bring physical automation into human purposed environments. So then the question became, are there specific industries or use cases for which this is useful? Not that I wasn't the only could not find something that could move autonomously through a construction site. So that was problem number one was like perception, locomotion, autonomy. Can you give me a platform that can move through the site? You can, great. Now let's put something useful on it, like a laser scanner, like a 360 camera. Now let's take that data and send it wirelessly from the job site to these cloud applications we're already using. Okay, now we've actually established a proof of concept feedback loop that shows that there is value yeah. here. And when you say the other um, robot stretch, is that the the kind of more human looking looking one with the? No, that's yeah. So the human looking one that does backflips and parkour and oh, stuff okay. is Atlas, and that's that's an R and D uh, humanoid or bipedal robot. Uh, Stretch is our newest robot. Um, there was a previous iteration of it called Handle, so it was this like hybrid of wheels oh. and legs, and then it turned into something that looked kind of like an ostrich because it had a long arm for box picking with a vacuum gripper. And then it got fully redesigned and turned into Stretch, which is now a you know something that is uh, another robot that we're selling uh, to the warehouse industry to do things like unload uh, trucks. I see. I see. Well, do you think the the do you say Atlas one will also move into the construction industry at some point or not yet? I mean that. I mean that that you can see is like <laughs> I get, you know yeah. literally laying bricks or something like that. But again, maybe a little bit overkill, but. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess it could, could be. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, it, it begs the question, right? Because it's like, it always begs that question about what are we trying to achieve with, with robots? And I don't, I don't see, you know, value or, or really, I don't see the point of making something that just replaces the human body and replaces all those tasks. I mean, that'll, that'll take a very long time. I think that what we're seeing is, 
you get value from something that is very purpose built for the task in order to help the human worker be more productive and safe in what they're doing. Uh, Dusty Robotics Layout Robot is a really great example of that. The Canvas Drywall Finishing Robot is a great example of that. The Hilti JBot Overhead Ceiling Drilling Robot is a great example of that. They do things that are dull, dirty, or dangerous, the domain of robotics. Um, they allow a single human operator to be a lot more productive and get more work done um, in an era where you know, margins are thinning, there's a skills gap, and you just need to have more output generally. And in a lot of cases, they, they allow that operator to do their work without sustaining injuries. And even think about like long-term stress injuries that can happen too, so that they can have longer and more fruitful careers and, you know, retire and spend yeah. time with their family, all these sorts of things. So I think that's really the goal. And when you're doing that, you're not replacing the human body. You're finding a specific form factor um, that performs a task, um, usually in concert or some kind of collaboration with a person. Um, and then that's what's getting things done. So the if you're not doing task specific, you're doing what we're doing with Spot, which is a platform. And again, it's, it's this agile mobility platform. If you think about um, environments that are designed for robotics, you know, you can have like an Amazon warehouse, you can have the like little Amazon robots going around, you have some kind of AMR, you know, mobile robots with wheels, because the ground is really predictable and flat. But when you're trying to bring any kind of automation, any kind of robotics into these construction sites, you need to be able to get anywhere on that site. And if you don't have some kind of generalized agile mobility solution, then you can't really get far with any of that other stuff too. So I think there will always be, I'm again, I'm very bullish on all these other task specific robots I'm mentioning, but they're all limited by their ability to locomote across a typical construction site. They have to come in at a special time or the environment has to be specially prepared for them. Whereas the ability to use legs and kind of more dynamic robots, you don't have to change the way you work. And that reduces the amount of friction it takes to adopt robots into the construction site, which yeah, is really important. I think everyone, I mean, the, the, the layman fear is like they see these these robots that are doing backflips and parkour and and you know spot the dog walking around and they think oh man this they're coming from my jobs kind of <laughs> kind of thing but it it seems to be more of like amplifying or or aiding or um, I mean this is like not unique to what, just what you guys are doing but like in general do you actually see that what, what's your view on that kind of like are we going to be losing a lot of jobs to automation? And this is not just robotics, but like, you know, just simple programming and things like that. Um, is that, is that something that's kind of like on your mind in the construction industry as well? Like, do you think a uh, man or, or woman will be replaced by, by these, these kind of machines or it's more just aiding and supporting them kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yes, job job loss from automation, and certainly job change from automation. These are these are real things and things that need to be actively discussed. But right. it happens everywhere, right? Um, I think I think Revit is probably the most most prevalent form of automation in in architecture um, in terms of automation of documentation right. practices. But you know, I think about even the even the Eleventh Avenue project that I mentioned before, I mean, that would have taken a very large yeah. team to document that facade. Um, but because we had these tools to, you know, essentially be able to revise that and automate the documentation of that anytime a formal change came in from big who are always so changing do. their minds, um, then that's right. So uh, we were able to deal yeah. with that and in a very efficient way and not require a huge, a huge team of people. And then the question asked is like, well, okay, we could have done that with a team of, you know, a dozen people, but do you want to like point by point document facade panels on a twisty building? So you usually contextualize that automation in like, what is the thing you're automating and would that have been yeah. pleasant to do otherwise <laughs> or, or even profitable, right? Cause you're still out of business and you need to, you need to make money and it needs to be somewhat efficient to get that work done. So the thing that I found attractive about spot when I was trying to think of how do I move into the construction robotics industry? Cause I do believe this is the future was that spot is doing something that right, no one right. was doing 
it's not it's not auto it's not automating a task that people were doing it's actually bringing in a level of data capture that yeah. just wasn't possible before um and that's really exciting and so it's not right. taking anyone's job because nobody was doing it uh which is which is nice that said as you build up these types of robotic capabilities it does slowly become more feasible yeah. for those fears to become a reality and yeah. I, and i don't want to be naive about that and you know i think about that quite a bit but i don't see spot you know any time in the near future being some kind of vehicle for like yeah. subcontractor trade automation i see it as being a vehicle for constant data capture that benefits all of these people working on site and that's the the other thing i always say too is like yes we should have this conversation um about robotics and job loss but like you have no idea how special it is what people yeah. are doing on site in terms of how capable humans are in general and then specifically these tradespeople on site you know they have nothing yeah. to fear from robots today do they have something to fear from robots in a hundred years maybe and that's why we i always uh whenever i bump into like people at conferences and stuff like that that work more with like the typical uh you know robotic arm doing 3d printing or cncing or, or whatever <laughs> they, they have this like and we had uh lydia who's a researcher at hong kong u working a lot with with robots and uh they they kind of have this dead stare of like this love hate relationship to for the robot <laughs> because like you you're like oh my god it must be able to do so many cool things and they're like no that it's the dumbest thing ever you literally have to tell it every single movement to do <laughs> and they have this kind of like dead look in their <laughs> eye like god I, I kind of hate the thing but i you know i also love it <laughs> but i'm sure like i know you, what you guys are yeah. doing is like you know on a whole other level where you know you're you're kind of using ai and all this kind of stuff to to kind of all, so they are intelligent and, and they do react to things but um i think yeah that that's one thing that always re reassures me is when i bump into these like you know robotic arm researchers in, in universities that <laughs> they're, they're not worried too much about these <laughs> these things taking over yeah and it's a it's a somewhat limited tool for the things that yeah. these researchers are trying to do too right they're just using yeah. fixed robotic that's arms because have. that's the that's the paradigm that's yeah that's the accessible technology so it it takes a really long time to develop new robotic morphologies uh i will at this point if um if anyone has a question or something they want to add in put your hand up uh i know we're close to an hour so um i don't want to keep you too long brian but uh yeah if anyone has a question raise your hand we'll bring you up um when do you think like will we start to see for example spot the dog more in general public like you know, not, and this is not just, just in the construction space, but like, you know, in a, cause it's got so many different applications, right? Uh, you know, would we see it in an airport, like, you know, for security reasons, or would we see it in a, in our cities as like a, you know, emergency response, like medic thing, or I, I don't know. I mean, it could be so many different things, but is there, is there something like, are we a few years away from kind of, it wouldn't be weird to see spot the dog walking down the street for some reason, you know, delivering a package or who, who knows. Yeah. I mean, spots not going to be used right. for, for everything. And there are a lot of really interesting robots out there, but yes, I, I do think so. And in fact, I mean, it's already happened to me. I saw, I, I saw a spot in, in San Francisco, um, and I didn't know whose it was and I didn't see anyone driving it. So I followed it until I found who was driving it. And I was like, who what are, are you, you doing? With and how, what are you using your spot? And it turned out, yeah, it turned out it was, it was formant, uh, F O R A M or F O R M A N T, um, who actually, uh, provide teleoperation, like virtual teleoperation experiences with spot that you can, you can sign up for. They're a really cool company that, that do like robot fleet management and stuff. But I've already experienced that where like I was out yeah, in public just... 
and just saw a spot. Granted, it's right. it's the it's the Bay Area, um, but but yeah, still, I would it's love happening. to see. I mean, I feel like it's not going to be long until I see some hipster walking around with Spot the Dog around Brooklyn just for. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why a hipster would waste their money on a, an industrial well, robot. Why dog, not? But uh, it's yeah. also about what <laughs> yeah, they to do. Do you get to uh, <laughs> borrow the dog? Like I'm, I'm imagining you right now just chilling out, and then spot the dogs coming and delivering you a beer from the fridge. <laughs> do you get special? <laughs> they are. They are so loud. I mean, this is something I think people often mistake spot for, right. a, for a consumer electronic. Like industrial. These, these are these are like yeah. loud industrial robots that uh, would make. Would a we lot see of a little mini, mini kind of um, consumer one? You know, in a, do you think? I mean, I love i I love that idea. Um, I think that would be really fun, but we're we're super yeah. focused and honed in. On I mean, uh, as any technology, over time, it will become more and more accessible, more and more affordable, and who knows? It could be the latest, be like the next gen Tamagotchi. That that maybe it's like a fun thing people will have, <laughs> which would be kind of cool. Um, I see we got two people yeah. come up to stage. Uh, I'm pronouncing this right, Ash Ashwara. Do you have a question or a comment you want to add? Or hey, uh, yeah, hi, yeah, it's Aishwarya, yeah, but uh, it's fine if you say Aish here. Yeah. Um, hi, and first of all, uh, hey, Brand. Um, I hey, don't know if you how are you? I'm good. <laughs> you remember? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's great. It's really great uh, getting all these insights from you um, in a in a one to one basis. And uh, I've always I've, I've followed uh, Spot like and the videos. And oh, oh my god, it it is really good. And I've, I've I show all, show it to all my friends and colleagues. And yeah, it's really great. And congratulations on getting it to where it is right now. Um, and I wanted to know uh, if. Uh, robotics is ever going to be very uh, I mean is it going to be catered uh, in a sustainable way I mean not I know what robots would do would be like something looking towards sustainability but then are robots itself going to be built in a sustainable way in the future um, like uh, you could say as you said like in the last conversation you you had um, like mass produced and like consume, consumer sort of uh, robots yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, one of the things that Boston Dynamics has done from like gasoline powered robots with the earliest large quadrupeds in the, in the early aughts to everything being battery powered and electric. Um, mm-hmm. And and I think there's we're always trying to find ways to be more sustainable in the manufacturing of these robots, especially as we scale. The nice thing about uh, Hyundai being the primary owner of Boston Dynamics is to be able to tap into their supply chain and sustainable manufacturing expertise. And Hyundai is also doing a lot of really exciting things right now with electric vehicles and other sustainable approaches to manufacturing and mobility. So I think that's one of the most exciting aspects of the new ownership of Boston Dynamics is to be able to continue to move in that direction. The other thing worth mentioning here too, and one of the applications I'm most excited about with Spot is uh, renewable energy infrastructure. One of the most prevalent sites where people are asking for the robot are solar farms. And that yeah. is that is a really big part of the next 10 years of construction is investing in solar and other renewable energy sources. And these are large, vast construction and operational sites that Uh, it's been really hard for the workers there to be able to track and monitor. So I think the use of these robots could help accelerate uh, that infrastructure as well. Yeah, that that is great. Uh, I mean, that that is good to know that uh, they're working towards all of this. And uh, uh, how how much carbon emissions do you think, like, uh, would it take for, like, I know, I know the exact numbers wouldn't be appropriate, but then like, uh, as of now, like, are we standing in a good carbon emission uh, rate point of view? Like, to produce a robot? To produce? I have no idea. And oh, I, I will, yeah, I should look, I should look. I mean, up. it doesn't seem like <laughs> yeah, a highly unsustainable question. thing. I mean, the things are powered by 
batteries and electricity. So it's it's kind of like an electric car, right? It's more of a question of where you're getting the the mm-hmm. electricity from. Um, but I, you know, I can't imagine it's it's like a right. e- epically huge uh, carbon footprint to to make it. I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought. Um, but I think it's it. Would that make sense, Brian? It's it's more. I would say it's more about where the energy is coming from to to power the thing, right? Yeah, I suspect yeah. I suspect it's not bad, but I think it's a good question um, and and absolutely something that that I know that we're committed to improving upon. Even if we're doing an okay yeah. job, you can always do a better job. So um, yeah, yeah, I'll try to. I should <laughs> I should figure that out and have an answer ready for that. Interesting question. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's nice. All right. Great talking to you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, nice to see you. Bye-bye. Um, bye bye. Yeah, super interesting. I uh, I think we got a. Uh, Z, sorry if I'm pronouncing, I'm terrible at pronunciation, but uh, do you have a comment or a question you want to put out there? Hey. Yes, hi, Ellie, I do. So I wanted to know if Boston Dynamics is inspired by Black Mirror or um, is Black Mirror inspired by companies like Boston Dynamics? Yeah, uh, Boston Dynamics was founded in 1992, um, so it beat Black Mirror by a lot. Yeah, Black Mirror has been the bane of my existence. Uh, Black Mirror is if they have they have interviewed they've interviewed the director of that episode. Uh, Black Mirror, the robot there, was directly inspired by the quadrupeds that Boston Dynamics had already been working on. So that director obviously had a. Uh, fictional idea about uh taking that to the extreme uh in a dystopian representation and unfortunately uh unfortunately now i have to assure people that you know spot will not mercilessly hunt and kill you for no reason um that was and, my next question. Is, yeah i mean it's you know that also opens up the question that we're you know absolutely committed along with you know many other types of legged robot manufacturers in the u.s like agility um and an animal in Europe to uh, not allowing anyone to weaponize our products. Um, you know, we are, we're firmly against that and that's, that's against our user terms. Um, the, yeah, Black Mirror is, is, uh, a th- <laughs> it's so far uh, off reality in terms of the capabilities of these machines, their abilities to make their own decisions, uh, and the weaponization and, and use of them. So, uh, there is, there is no reality in that whatsoever. That said, it's always good to highlight our commitment, um, to, to be against the weaponization I feel like of a, these robots. A $1, uh, stick on boggly eyes would just solve that problem. They just look so so inviting and friendly with the little uh, the little stick on it. It actually would have been interesting if the Black Mirror robot had been a friendly looking robot. I always thought that might have been an even more compelling way to do it instead of the extremely menacing like black steel um, that they used for that. That's uh, awesome. Um, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna ask Brian. So your robots can fly, dance, fight, etc. But what other unforeseen activities will they be able to do in the future? Well, there's usually nothing unforeseen because we have to work really, really hard to get the robot to do anything. Um, an example of like unforeseen behavior is, I think, a lot less sexy than you might think. Which is, I remember the first time I saw Spot being able to walk over rebar on a construction site. And up until that point, I didn't think it was possible. I figured the robot would, you know, would get caught up in the rebar and trip. And it turns out that all of the other work we had put into, you know, stabilizing the robot as it walked across different types of trains actually worked really well for rebar too. So that's about the level of surprise I think we get from the robot because to make it do any of those dance moves is months and months and months of work and, and programming and trial and error in the real world. Um, but that said, like, what will we be surprised by in terms of people using those existing behaviors for? I mean, I hope, I hope lots of interesting things. I mean, even the fact that dancing, you know, that there are entertainment companies out there using dancing robots, um, is, is really, is really cool. Um, I never would have thought that that would have been a large 
segment for these things. And I suspect there will be lots of other um, entertainment applications in the future as well. Um, so yeah, I can't predict the future, so I guess we'll see, but, um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully, uh, again, like I just, I think that, um, it's good to have these talks about how robots work, how hard it is to get them to do anything and how they will only do the exact thing you tell them to do. I think it's really important, you know, to, to hammer that home. I think in popular, in popular culture and media, AI has been some kind of all encompassing term for robots making their own decisions and having their own agency. And we're just, we're just not there yet. Um, that's not really how it works. And frankly, there's, there's barely any AI proper in, in these robots. It's the blood, sweat and tears of engineers uh, and doing trial and error and a lot of math. Yeah. I, could, I, I think, yeah, that's, that's one of the perceptions from outside. It's like, these things are just kind of, you know, intelligent in the way, but there's just so much uh, time spent to like, get them to do ex these exact movements and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think that's. I want to, I wanted to jump. I want the robot to run and jump into the back of my pickup truck. That would be like, that would oh, be delightful for me. So I don't have yeah, to how like much does, how much does it weigh? There it is somewhere. Uh, it's, I think. Okay. Okay. 70 so not, pounds. Okay. It's, it's not light, but it's not crazy. Yeah. Not not too not too bad, but you know if you're doing yeah, if you're loading it and unloading it, you know a lot. Yeah, interesting. Could, yeah. All right, so maybe to to kind of uh, finish it, finish the conversation with a little bit, and, and to zoom back out to uh, you know a young architect. Uh, one of the reasons we we kind of set up uh, Architect Network and these talks was to kind of you know uh, improve conversation around technology and adoption of technology mm -hmm. in our industry, which is you know. I think we're we're slow to adopt even simple technology like like BIM, for example. What you know, what advice from from your perspective would you give to uh, young architects coming into this space? I mean, um, or or like you know, what do you see as the future of of architecture practice and things like that? You know, as a you've obviously gone through a regular architect to be a computational specialist. Um, do you have any pearls of wisdom you would? you would put out there? Well, yeah, I think, I think being open and adaptable to what architecture is and how it can be practiced is important. And to understand that it is constrained mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, it's, it's constrained by the various social constraints of our society. It's constrained by the regulatory and disciplinary bodies that govern it. Um, it's, it's constrained by the way it's taught. There are a lot of, there are a lot of gatekeepers out there. I mean, some of them are, you know, necessary for public health and safety, but some of them I think tend to overly constrict what we think is possible. But I don't, I don't think that people, especially students have a problem thinking what's beyond the possible, yeah. but then they need to reconcile it with the way things are practiced now. So for me, that's one getting on site. If you, if you want to design buildings that get built, the more you can be on site and the more you can speak to and learn from yeah. the people who actually build it, the better. Um, I think we have this like idea that technology will allow architects to, you know, play God and, and design and build their own stuff. But that's, that's simply not how it works, nor how it really should. I don't think that would be very beneficial. Um, and I also think it's important to understand the various business models that govern the practice of architecture, because it does not matter what you do technologically. It does not matter how good of a coder you are, how much fabrication you know, if you can whisper to robots or not. None of that is going to change the industry if you don't understand the business practices. And yes, it can be boring to learn, but when you realize the amount of change you can affect through understanding that business model and then changing it in combination with your technological and design interests, I mean, that's really where the power lies yeah. to to actually change um, things a i see bit. we have do you have time for two questions brian or are you i think we got uh sure. lily i don't know if she's on the phone though uh lily you there and then we also had uh, someone else probably. 
Oh, hey. Uh, no, yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Uh, hi. Uh, uh, thank you for this amazing discussion. It was so useful. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, today, uh, we use uh, robotics in a, in a very small scale. But I want to know if you want to use uh, several robots in uh, construction in a massive scale. Is that affordable uh, to use them? It can uh, maybe they can uh, reduce price of construction. I mean, not exactly in direct way. Maybe they can uh, we can program it uh, in a way that uh, they can save materials or save time. I just want to know: Is that affordable to use them in a massive scale for construction? Yeah, so you cut out a little bit there, but I think generally um, when you're working with industrial arms like in academic labs or, or in research, yeah, you, you tend to be limited to a single work cell. So the applications are a little bit less sophisticated. So you might have an idea of if I deploy multiple work cells on site, you know, can I have interesting things or, you know, achieve more complex tasks. But I think that, again, industrial arms are the domain of the factory. Um, of off-site industrialized construction and which is great because you can take you know the god what like century of, of of maturity that industrial arms and manufacturing spaces have and apply those lessons to a subset of architectural components and where things do need to be rethought is is mobility and and then mobile manipulation as well on these cannot just stick an arm and expect that to do something useful for you on a construction site. Believe me, I have, I have tried it. Um, it's got to be a fundamentally different approach. And, you know, Spot is one example, and I suspect more will emerge. Um, but, you know, the fundamental question, how much will the site itself change? Um, how much will industrialized construction change the site? Because if the environment changes, then the whole kind of game changes. One of Spot's biggest strengths is that it can just go into a traditional construction site and be fairly successful with its with its autonomy. So um, that's where I always try to get people to think about the future of robotics, which is how is industrialized construction methods, how are those changing the site? What's actually being done on the site? What is the nature of the site? And then that will inform the types of robots that can add value. Yeah, interesting. I feel like it's it's a super exciting time to be an architect. There's all this such interesting technology coming on. It's all moving so quickly. Uh, industry is is like ripe for disruption. Uh, I think it's a it's exciting time to be an architect. No. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I still don't want to be one, but it. But well, yeah. you are, you are an architect, right? You never not be one. But I mean, you're an architect working with robots, right? I mean, That's, yeah, but you're I, still an architect. Would you not say? Would you Would you identify as an architect? Well, I never got li- I never got licensed. Um, I do, I do. I I identify as a designer. I mean, I yeah. architecture will always be my my first love, and the production of the built environment. I just started to you know one of the nice things about being at WeWork was you didn't have to think about it strictly in terms of the architect versus the engineer Mm. versus the general contractor. You could, you could start to think about it holistically, which is, you know, how do I, how do I deliver and even operate a building and what is a building as a product and how can I, as a professional, yeah, I think that's an interesting thing about like WeWork and and Katera and that kind of stuff. It was, it was all like in-house. And I think by just doing that, I think you cut out so much energy in communication, potentially litigation and this whole. Well, and yeah. And we could go and we yeah. could go visit our sites and talk to the subcontractors. And when the, and when the project was done, we could go live in those yeah, projects that's, that's... and work in those projects. I mean, it, it yeah. makes a difference. I think architects are so disconnected from the spaces yeah. they yeah, build. Totally and that's one of the big challenges. Um, Awesome. I think, uh, I don't know if anyone else has any questions, but, uh, oh, yeah, shoot, if you have one. Uh, hi, okay. uh, one uh, can I ask one question? Oh, okay. Uh, if you don't have time, it's okay. I can, I can just... Uh, Go on, shoot, uh, shoot your question. Uh, but if you have time, I can. 
Okay, uh, so I wanted to know oh, uh, this part when it was uh, used for with the partnership with Foster and Partners uh, for the uh, 3D scan. Uh, what were your personal uh, uh, difficulties or like, I mean, what, what are your personal uh, outputs from the whole uh, experience with Spot had during that time? Yeah, so that was uh, the Foster and Partners work was one of the earliest applications of scanning to an ongoing commercial construction project that was in, I think that started in January or February of 2020, right before the pandemic. And we learned a lot about um, the limitations of the robot's ability to deal with constantly changing environments. Um, the initial focus in construction was the ability to handle the irregular terrain, dynamic obstacles to go up and down stairs. And then what I've been working on partially as an outcome of the Foster and Partners experience um, over the last you know year and a half is improving the autonomy system specifically for dynamic environments like construction sites. What we've learned is that what we thought of as static environments are actually also dynamic environments and that dynamic environments are chaos. So we've had to build in quite a bit of functionality that simul basically it's a weird contradiction, which is that the user wants the robot to do the same exact thing every time and to collect the same data but the site is constantly in flux and those data points aren't always accessible. So you have to build in variation and flexibility, both from the perspective of the robot to do something automatically and from the operator to allow the operator to, you know, recognize things a priori and, and instruct that to the robot. Um, so that's been, that's been a huge push and, you know, we're really excited about what we have coming out. 2.4 is the is the newest software that's coming out approximately at the end of the summer. And that has really focused on the ability for the robot to successfully get through uh, these sites. So, you know, examples that I've seen in the testing of it that have been really promising are, you know, the robot able to uh, trace walls that weren't there, Um when it initially went through the space and to perceive the walls and then essentially walk along the wall until it finds a new opening and continue with the mission, the ability for the robot those doors and basically, you know, repath plan around the building because all, all it wants to do is get the data that you want it to get. So, but the problem is, is that those data points are often blocked or door, doors are closed. And this is all the stuff that was happening with Foster and Partners. Like somebody closed the door. There was a pallet of materials in the way. Um, you know, somebody laid out a box of, of light bulbs and the robot walked on. You know, all these things that can go wrong on any kind of construction site. And to build in a better user interface and autonomy system to deal with that. And I, I think what we have is really exciting. Um, and I can't wait for it to be released. Wow, that's great. Thank you for telling us about that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think, um, yeah, we've had you for a good hour and a bit, so I don't want to keep you from your uh, your chilled Sunday or whatever you're doing. You're in it. You're you moved out to Long <laughs> Island. Oh, see. That's right. He says, after Long Island. Island. Hey, living the dream the on, the, on the shores of Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But uh, awesome. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for spending time and, and talking with us. This was super interesting. Uh, and yeah, I'm kind of excited to continue to see what you, what you guys are doing and, and all the people you're collaborating with. So um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting uh, topic. And, you know, I feel like it's just scratching the surface. We're, we're just going to see more and more exciting stuff. But um, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Like I said, we are re recording these now, so we will post these at a later date, and we'll post it on our Instagram account. Uh, we will have a talk next week, so uh, if you're not already following, check out our Instagram account, architect uh, underscore network. Make sure to follow Brian. Give him a follow on Clubhouse and try and keep him on the Clubhouse game. <laughs> and hopefully Brian will see you in a few, uh, in a few more rooms in the future. Awesome. Yeah, thank thanks you everyone, so much, everyone, and have an ending. awesome Sunday. All right, cheers, guys. All right, bye bye.